In the previous episode, we had some fun experimenting with our Kubota D722 powered Saturn Coupe. Now, for the record, the D722 is a 719cc 20 horsepower diesel engine, and we put it in a 2,000 pound car. If you haven't guessed by now, the car is definitely slow, but we're working on making it go faster. If you're new to the channel, well, this is the kind of stuff we do. As I speak, we're diligently working on the upgrades to the diesel powered Saturn, but unfortunately, we're not ready to bring you that video yet. These things take time, so when the car's ready, you folks will be the first to know. Anyway, one of our local viewers who goes by the name of Joe reached out and offered to sell us one of his parts cars for a few bucks above scrap value. Joe indicated the car was in pretty bad shape, and that's pretty accurate as you'll see. Without further ado, let's see if we can get our new project car running and driving. So what we're looking at is a 1985 Volkswagen Rabbit or Golf. I really don't know, but more importantly, I don't care. You see, it's not about the car, it's about what's under the hood, and in this case, it's a 1.6 liter diesel engine. This normally aspirated engine makes a ground pounding 54 horsepower at 4800 RPM and 73 pounds feet of torque at a mere 2300 RPM. It ain't much, but this is the most powerful engine we've experimented with so far. So this thing's just basically a parts car that was saved from the crusher specifically because it has a theoretically good diesel engine in it. Well, it's been a while since this car last ran, and today we're going to get it running again, hopefully. So some folks like to second guess my opinions, and in my opinion this car has seen better days. And as a matter of fact, at this point this car is on borrowed time because it's going to the scrapyard immediately after we pull the engine and transmission from the semi-rolling dumpster. So what qualifies this car as junk? Well, obviously it's missing a lot of parts. Meh, that's not really a big deal. Parts can be found if given enough time. The big problem, but not the only problem, is this car has virtually no floors left in it, and that's because it was parked many years with the windows open, which is not a good thing to do, by the way. And that's a shame, because this car is showing only 156,000 miles on the clock. The other problem with leaving a car outside with the windows down is wild animals have used this car as a toilet. Oh, it gets worse, and we'll get into that in a moment. The good news is the car does have a four-speed manual transmission, so booyah, a diesel engine with a manual transmission. I reckon the Volkswagen folks in the audience are licking their lips right now. Oh yeah, it also has vice grip steering. Meh, it works. Let's bring the car inside the building to take a better look at it. Yeah, that's better. It doesn't look too bad, but like I say, it gets worse. Let's pop the hood and take a better look at the engine bay. Now under the hood, it may in fact look pretty clean for a car that's been sitting a long time, and I assure you, that's not how we received the car. As I previously mentioned, this car was used as a toilet by wild animals, and this cowl area was, well, full of stuff that normally gets flushed away after using the toilet. And I mean it was full. But it's clean now, and it wasn't easy. You see, we had to cut a trench down the side of the car in order to flush the solids away. It's a bit extreme, but it was the only way we could get it done. So here's a better look at the trench we had to cut into the side of this Volkswagen. And the truth is, well, this trench is kind of small for the amount of material we had to flush out. So in case you're wondering how it all went down, well, this is YouTube and we have video of that. First of all, we had to jack the car up to, you know, get the angle right. And over here, you can see we already cut the trench into the side of the car. Let's take a better look. Yup, it's extreme, but if we had to do it again, this trench would have been bigger. A lot bigger. <clears throat> kind of reminds me of my last trip to Taco Bell, if you know what I mean. So thankfully most of the stuff actually flowed under the car, and you're welcome to use your imagination because we're not going to show you that. What you're seeing here is mostly dirt. The neat thing is, this modification is completely reversible, and all a person has to do is bend this flexible panel back into position. And, at some point in the future, if needed, the trench can be reactivated. However, this car won't be with us any longer than necessary. Now, for the folks who are sensitive to this subject, well, I certainly apologize. But as we continue moving forward in this video, the mess under the hood is extremely relevant. So when we were cleaning up the engine bay, we found this jug, and it was sitting right over here, which, by the way, is conveniently close to the detached fuel lines. So it looks like the last time this car ran, well, it was running on fuel from this jug. I reckon that's both good and bad. Now we did clean the loose debris and stuff from the engine bay, but we didn't clean the grease and gunk from the engine, and quite frankly, this engine appears to be pretty clean, all things considered. 
We're primarily focused on the engine. There's a bunch of unnecessary stuff in our way. Most of this stuff is damaged and we won't be using it anyway. Give me a moment to clear the engine bay a little better so we can get a good look at the engine. We might have gotten a little carried away. I tell you, the deeper we dug, the more stuff we found that was no good, and that includes the wiring harness. But keep in mind, on an older diesel engine like this one, it doesn't need much in wiring and can be easily hot wired to get it running. So the old wire harness isn't really necessary for our purposes. The good news is, the radiator had plenty of antifreeze in it, so the engine block is likely good. Now we can get a better look at today's project. After we stripped all the unnecessary parts, we rolled the car back outside again and gave the engine a quick blast with the power washer. And she cleaned up real well. You know, the nice part about working on this older German engine is the lack of plastic parts. Sure, there's a couple of chunks of plastic here and there, but if you ever looked under the hood of a modern Volkswagen, well, all you see is plastic. I reckon now is a good time to check the oil. Yeah, it's dark, and that's sort of normal on a diesel. I think we're safe for now, and the oil's probably okay to start the engine with, so we're going to go with it. Given that there was so much debris in the engine bay, I think it would be prudent to take a quick look at the timing belt. From what I gleaned on the internet, this is an interference engine, and in simple terms, what that means is, if the timing belt fails, well, all the parts inside the engine will sort of hit each other, and you'll have a hot mess on your hands. Anyway, a failed timing belt can do a lot of expensive damage on an interference engine, so it's probably best we take a look at it before we go any further. Okay, well that's not what I expected. Oof. It appears the timing belt area is contaminated with dirt and other unknown substances. Yeah, we got big chunks of stuff just laying on the belt. Kinda looks like mud, and whether or not it is, it's a problem nonetheless. So this is futile, but we went ahead and vacuumed most of the debris out of the timing belt area. But, I reckon some of this stuff has found its way down to the crankshaft pulley, so we need to inspect that next. So the thing I don't like about Volkswagen engines is, the fact that they use Allen head bolts on a lot of the components. Let's see if my little Makita impact driver can get them off. Nope. 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 And yep. Well, we got one off. I guess for the rest we'll need to use a breaker bar. So with the pulley off, we can see a lot of debris has gotten into this lower section. Let me take this cover off so we can get a better look. Yeah, this dog ain't gonna hunt. We have a lot of stuff down here, and we're gonna have to pull the timing belt to clear this area of all the debris. You know, at this point, if we crank the engine over, the belt's definitely gonna fail for sure. Better safe than sorry. So I've replaced many timing belts in the past. However, this is my first time working on a Volkswagen diesel engine, so I cheated and did some Googling. Anyway, one of the timing marks on this engine is located underneath the back side of this cam cover, so we'll need to take that off. The crankshaft timing mark is actually on the flywheel, and it can be checked by looking through this inspection hole on the bell housing. Fast forward a bit and we have the cam cover off. Now check this out, this engine's pristine on the inside. I was definitely not expecting this. So this is either a new cylinder head, or this engine's been taken care of all its life. Anyway, the timing mark we're looking for is back here. And yeah, here it is. This groove on the back side of the camshaft is what we're looking for. It looks like we're going to need to spin the engine 360 degrees to get this slot to line up before we can pull the timing belt. Okay, fast forward a bit and we have the slot on the camshaft in the correct position. Over on the front of the engine, the timing mark on the injector pump pulley lines up with the mark on the timing belt cover thingy. So far, so good. Let's see if the crankshaft lines up. Well, it looks like the crankshaft timing mark is off. It may be that the timing belt jumped one or two teeth. Not good, but let's keep moving forward and pretend we didn't see this. So before we remove the timing belt, I need to lock the injector pump into position. For that, we're going to use a quarter inch drive 11 millimeter Craftsman deep socket because it fits perfectly. Next, we'll need to loosen the belt tensioner thingy. Now, like I mentioned before, this is the first time I ever worked on a Volkswagen diesel engine. I would later find out that this bolt here needs to be loosened and the pulley needs to be bumped with a soft blow hammer to loosen it from the camshaft. But for now you can watch me struggle to get the timing belt off. When all else failed, cutting the belt off seemed reasonable to me. Now you can clearly see that there's more debris on this pulley and this pulley. Both of these guys are going to need a good cleaning before we put the new timing belt on. Now this belt tension idler pulley should be replaced whenever the timing belt's changed. However, this thing seems to be in decent condition and our goal is just to get the engine running. I think for now this pulley will be fine for short term use. The crankshaft pulley is definitely going to need a good cleaning and for that we'll use a toothbrush and some solvents. I'm sure you folks don't want to watch me do this, so let's fast forward a bit and the area is now clean. Now we're making some progress. 
Both of these pulleys were cleaned using the same method and are ready to accept a new timing belt. Over on the back side of the engine, we need to lock the camshaft into place. Now there's a tool available for this that you can purchase, but we made our own from a chunk of angle iron. In order to get this to fit perfectly into the camshaft slot, we used the belt sander to skim off some material. So we saved a few bucks by having a different tool that we used to make the tool that we needed. Anyway, we rotated the crankshaft and put it in the right position. So in order to keep the crankshaft from moving while we install the belt, we used a wrench and a pair of vice grips to hold it in position. Of course, the injector pump is correctly aligned with the socket jammed into the alignment hole, so no worries there. Now on this pulley, the bolt should have been loosened prior to removing the timing belt, but we screwed up. However, we did manage to loosen the bolt. Now this pulley is loose and can spin freely. A lot of folks believe that the tool on the end of the camshaft provides a method to hold the cam while you loosen the bolt. As I understand it, this is not the preferred method, and the correct way to loosen the bolt is to use a counter torque tool on the cam pulley. That way you don't transfer the torque through the camshaft and possibly do some damage. And that makes sense to me, and that's why we made a simple counter torque tool from some angle iron and aluminum bushings. Of course, we made our own tool, but these can be purchased from various sources. Anyway, the tool works like this to loosen and tighten the camshaft bolt. So theoretically, we're ready to slip the timing belt on, but not so fast. Today we're trying to get the engine to run, and we're trying to get the engine to run. Yeah, <laughs> I said that twice, and for a good reason. Replacing the timing belt will get the engine to run, hopefully, but we also have to deal with priming the injector pump. Normally, to prime the injector pump, well, you have to crank the engine over for a long time, and eventually it'll start. Well, instead of doing that, let's just spin the injector pump over with a drill to prime and purge the fuel lines. So what we'll need to do is connect the fuel supply line to this nipple like so, and then drop the fuel line into a container of fuel. Now I did some research, and as far as I can tell, Volkswagen doesn't use a transfer pump on this engine. So theoretically spinning the injector pump over is enough to draw fuel into the pump. So let's try that first. But before we do that, we have to supply the fuel shutoff valve with 12 volts. The purpose of this valve is actually to be able to shut the engine off. The way this valve works is, giving it power provides a path for the fuel to flow, and removing the power stops the fuel and the engine will instantly shut off. That's because diesel engines don't have an ignition system with spark plugs and whatnot. Nope, basically once a diesel engine's running, the only way to shut it off is to cut the fuel supply, and that's what this shutoff valve does. So we have our battery hooked up, and all we need to do now is hotwire the shutoff valve. And if you listen closely, you can hear the valve click when I give it power. So I admit this is a little sketchy and hopefully we don't short circuit the power leads. One last thing before we spin the injector pump over. The nuts on top of each of the injectors were loosened and that will allow the fuel lines to purge. If we didn't loosen these nuts, the fuel would likely squirt into the cylinders and that would hydro lock the engine the first time we cranked it over. Hydro locking is not a good thing and we won't be doing that today. Alright, let's see if we can prime and purge this injection system. Long story short, the injector pump doesn't seem to have the ability to draw the fuel in. Perhaps this is normal, or there's something wrong with the pump. No idea. So now we're going to use a transfer pump to prime the injector pump. This rig here is something we use on our small engine dynos, and it's fitted with a low pressure fuel pump. We went ahead and flushed all the gasoline out of the system, and now it's ready to pump diesel fuel. Let's try this again with the transfer pump. Hell yeah, that's exactly what we wanted, and this saved us many hours of trying to get the injector pump primed and purged. Of course, each of these injector nuts now have to be tightened. Now, if I didn't show this, someone would likely fault me in the comment section. Well, off camera, we slipped the timing belt on, and that was the easy part. Now we need to set the belt tension and then tighten the cam bolt. So there is a special tool needed in order to set the timing belt tension. And guess what? We ain't got that tool. So instead of buying it, we're going to improvise and use a snap ring removal tool. Yeah, it ain't the right tool, but it'll definitely work. Keep in mind the cam pulley is still loose, and we want it loose. The cam itself is still locked into position with our homemade tool, so no worries there. The bolt should just be touching the pulley. I guess I should mention that there's no key that aligns the camshaft to the pulley, and the cam and pulley fit together via a tapered shaft, and once everything is aligned and tensioned, then the camshaft and pulley can be locked together by tightening this bolt. Volkswagen made a lot of these engines, and this system seems to work fine. Anyway, the tension on the belt is kinda hit and miss. I use the snap ring pliers to rotate the tensioner pulley clockwise, 
and then check the tension of the belt by twisting it. If the tension's correct, the belt should twist or deflect about 90 degrees or thereabouts. Now some of these idler pulleys have marks on them in order to set the tension, but it appears this one doesn't have the marks on it, so we'll use the belt twist method in order to set the tension. And that's it, we're done. Let's see if this engine runs. So here's how it's gonna go down. The injector pump is primed and loaded with fuel and the injector system's been purged. The fuel shutoff valve is energized and there's a clear path for the fuel to flow. Now whether or not we need it, the transfer pump is powered up and is pumping fuel. All we need to do now is give the glow plugs power for about 15 seconds and it's showtime. You guys ready? Actually, I was expecting more drama, but this is nice. It sounds like the engine's hitting on all four right away, so chances are all the glow plugs worked. So over here is the oil pressure sending unit. I have it connected to a multimeter. Let's confirm the engine has oil pressure. So we're going to put the meter in ohms mode and check the resistance of the oil pressure switch. And it's showing about zero, which is good. That means the oil pressure switch is closed and the engine has oil pressure. So it runs, but there isn't a cooling system. Let's shut it down and put the cooling system back in the car. Okay, fast forward a bit and the radiator's back in. Unfortunately, we have a massive leak. So it turns out the coolant leak was the result of these bolts being loose or missing, so that was an easy fix. Alright, round three and all the leaks have been resolved, more or less, and now the car is running again. This time we're going to let the engine get up the temperature and then run some diesel purge through the system by filling the little fuel reservoir with this stuff. So you may ask, is diesel purge snake oil or does it really work? And my response is, I don't know. I've used this stuff on my diesel Mercedes in the past and it made no difference. Okay, let's stop the video for a second and take a snapshot of our little fuel tank. Now as the diesel purge circulates through the injector pump, most of the product is returned back to the tank through this return hose. Eventually the engine will consume all this stuff, but the thing to watch for is the color change in the fuel. As the fuel circulates, the solvents in the diesel purge will theoretically clean the injector pump and the fuel will get darker. So let's watch the time lapse. After about 20 minutes of running, the engine needs to be shut off and that will allow the diesel purge to dissolve any remaining crud that may be in the injection system. In our case, we let the car sit for over an hour before we started the engine back up. Off camera, we zapped the glow plugs for about 15 seconds, but it does seem the engine started pretty fast this time. Now this is completely unrelated, but apparently our homemade water pump belt is still working, so that's encouraging. Let's watch the time lapse of the fuel again. Now at this point, we dumped regular diesel fuel in the tank and let that circulate through the system. Does this stuff work? Well, I don't know, and that's a fair and honest reply. Overall, the engine's been running for well over an hour today, and it sounds really good. It's hard to say why this car was taken off the road. I mean, it does have a lot of rust, but I'm not sure how much of that was from sitting. And as far as I can tell, this car has been sitting well over 10 years. Now let's get back to the diesel purge. If we look at the snapshots at the start and the end of the cleaning cycle, it does appear the fuel got darker, which means the diesel purge dissolved some crud, but I really can't say if that'll make a difference. Anyway, I think we need to take this car for a ride and confirm the transmission works. Well, that should be fun. I'm not really looking forward to driving this thing. Let's take a better look at what we're dealing with. Yeah, not good, but we can make it work. 
So it's not exactly premium leather, but this cardboard should help me from acquiring any new diseases. At least that's the plan. Let's do a quick safety check and then we can be on our way. Okay, so I reconnected the throttle cable and, well, it's a little bit sticky. Perhaps we'll avoid using the throttle, but if we need to, well, it mostly works. The fuel tank's pretty much filled, but I don't think we'll be using that much fuel on our journey. All right, well, let's give the glow plugs a quick jolt of electricity and see how this plays out. We'll fast forward this, but basically the glow plugs were allowed to warm up for 15 seconds. Let's see if this thing will move. Now keep in mind the shift knob is missing, and I don't know the shift pattern on this transmission, so it's going to take a bit to find reverse. Let's fast forward this as I sort out the shift pattern. Ah, there's reverse. Well, so far so good. The clutch works and reverse works. Now some of you may have noticed that we didn't check the brakes and well, there's a good chance they don't work. So I really can't tell much from this test drive other than the car is not making any unusual noises. And yeah, we have no brakes. Well, the good news is the camera survived. Let's check all the gears just for fun. So far we know first gear works and reverse works. Second gear seems to work. Third gear is working, and for the grand finale, let's dump it in fourth gear. Yep, this car checks out. I think we have ourselves a winner. Well, this is going to be the last time the engine's going to run for a little while. Let's talk about the plan. So I was looking at the internet, and I discovered that someone had transplanted a similar engine and transmission into a wee little Honda Insight. It looks like the engine fits pretty good, and I believe this is the TDI or turbo version of the engine. It's a lot newer than the one we were just playing with, but basically it's about the same as far as the dimensions go. Anyway, tucked in the corner of our studio, we just so happen to have the same car. Of course, our car has a supercharged fuel-injected intercooled 420cc Hemi engine from Harbor Freight. You know, it doesn't look like much, but this thing did the Kessel run in 12 parsecs. And for the metric crowd, that means we got the car up to 70 miles per hour, but in metric speed. If you're new to the channel and want to know more about this car, check out our older videos, and while you're at it, consider subscribing. So the way our schedule is working out, it looks like we'll do the diesel swap on the Insight before we do the 670V twin swap on that car. So the plan is to diesel swap the Insight. After that, we can do some testing and find out how the car performs with the diesel engine. Once we are done testing the diesel engine and the Insight, then we can do the 670V twin swap that we've been putting off. I'm not sure everybody would agree with my plan, but keep in mind you don't know all the details that I do and what needs to be done in order to get things done, if that makes any sense. Anyway, doing engine swaps is kind of what this channel does best, so we take a little detour and throw the VW engine in the Honda and have some fun with it. Then we can do the 670 V twin swap. I had a lot of fun today with this Volkswagen, but I think it's time to pull the engine out and say goodbye to the car. Until next time.